Okay, I hope you can start. Okay, good morning and everyone in the West Coast and uh, good evening for those in the East Coast and from Armenia or other places. This is the ARPA Institute panel discussion series. And um, before we start, I'd like to say a few words about what ARPA does and, um, and see if everybody can be interested in helping us out. Um, first of all, we send our announcements by emails. So if there's anyone, any of your friends who would like to receive our announcements, you can send their email to us, let's put it in the chat, and then we will send the announcements to everyone that you like us to send. Uh, we have a, a website, uh, arpainstitute.org, and uh, you can use our website, go to our website and donate uh, to help us do more in Armenia. Our main activities are actually in Armenia, and we we have uh, a few projects that we're working on. Uh, we've been working on a program called Nanotechnology Initiative. We're trying to establish a nanotechnology research capabilities and a center for research uh, in Armenia. And uh, we've been working on it with the World Bank. They were supposed to do a feasibility study last year, but because of the COVID situation, things have slowed down. So we are trying to restart it again now. And then we have a program with the Ministry of uh, Science, Education, Sports and, and Culture um, to establish the process of science fairs in schools like we do in the United States. Every school in the United States participates in science fairs and there's an international science fair every year during in May sometime where not only the United States schools participate but also internationally many countries send their representative uh, projects. And we are trying to start that uh, process also in Armenia. We uh, are going to have a science fair this um, the end of March or early April in Armenia, so that the selected best project will be presented in the International Science and Engineering Fair. This has been going on also for quite a, a few years um, until we, we were able to establish the process and uh, do it. We also have an invention competition for young scientists which we are trying to modify slightly to address the current situation due to the war and also the economic conditions in Armenia and Artsakh. So we are trying to establish a new set of guidelines, but we will send out the announcement soon. And we work also with the universities and many of the institutes of the National Academy of Sciences of Armenia like the Physical Research Institute in Ashtarak, where we provide both instrumentation and also guidelines and also scientific technical know-how. We work also with the Molecular Biology Institute, um, where we have sent a uh, sequencer and other kinds of instrumentation so that they can do research um, and uh, cutting edge actually chemical uh, um, DNA research in the Molecular Biology Institute. And also we work with the Chemical Physics Institute uh, providing science, science instrumentation and also guidelines. Physics Institute, which is now the Alekhania National Lab, where actually we are starting to work on a, uh, the establishment of a clean room, which will be the first clean room in Armenia a class 1000, which means there will be 1000 part particles per million particles or less, which will be used for um, very sensitive research. And uh, also we work with the universities where we, again, we provide instrumentation and also we have a online um, distance learning program 
where we find experts from various locations and they present their seminars from their computers and we connect through the internet and uh, in Armenia, the students and professors can follow. So the only activity that we have is um, in Los Angeles is organizing such panel discussions and lectures. And uh, today, uh, the moderator of our event will be our own Dr. Ani Shabazian, who is a professor at Loyola Marymount uh, uh, School University. And she'll be introducing the speakers and uh, moderate the event. Uh, Ani, the floor is yours. You're mute. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panosyan. Good morning and good evening to those of you joining from Armenia. I would like to thank the ARPA Institute for featuring this important conversation on healthcare in Armenia through, this, through their steadfast work, as Dr. Panosyan was talking about just recently, all their recent achievements. The ARPA Institute continues to serve as a steady reminder for us all that progress can be made together. When you look at Armenia and look at Armenia's many needs, quickly you realize that healthcare is something that needs much support. And healthcare is a human capital industry that relies on education and the immense training of each individual. The limited capacity of the Armenian healthcare sector became more evident during COVID and the war. This begets the question, to what degree is the medical industry and human capital cult cultivated in the medical sector in Armenia? A quick Wikipedia search reveals that there are 102 hospitals in Armenia, 44 of which are located in Yerevan. How does a small place like Armenia, who has a challenging environment on multiple levels rank in terms of the average standard of care that is offered in the medical sector? What are some of the obstacles? What are some of the success stories? Our objective with our time here today is to have a candid discussion about the state of affairs of Armenia's medical care and the three individuals who have both the credentials and the insider perspectives to answer these questions. Each having their own experiences ranging from providing medical care to on the front lines of the battlefield to round the clock fundraising for medical needs in the diaspora, all equally valid and different perspectives from three very special physicians and more importantly, human beings. I look forward to all of us listening closely and engaging with our speakers. I will ask a series of questions as the moderator, and then I would like to offer the floor to you so that so what I don't address you can in the chat box of the Zoom meeting. And so let us begin by me telling you a little bit more about our speakers. Dr. Armen Hagopjanyan is a graduate of Yerevan State Medical Institute in Armenia. He received his BS in Microbiology and Molecular Genetics from the University of California, Los Angeles, and later graduated from California College of Podiatry Medicine, earning his Doctor of Podiatric Medicine. Dr. Hagopjanyan completed his surgical residency at Western Medical Center in Orange County. He is board certified in foot and ankle surgery and in reconstructive rear foot and ankle surgery. Dr. Hagop Janyan is a former vice president of the Los Angeles Society of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, former chief of podiatry at Providence St. Joseph Medical Center in Northridge Hospital. He is the first podiatric surgeon who started total ankle replacement program in Los Angeles and still trains many surgeons around the country to perform this difficult yet rewarding procedure. Next, we have Dr. Viken Sepilian, who is the founder and director of American Fertility Specialists Medical Group in Los Angeles, California, and as a board certified physician specializing in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Dr. Sepilian has been an active member of the Armenian American Medical Society, serving as the president from 2009 to 2013. 
In 2017, Dr. Sapilian was elected the president of the Armenian Medical International Committee, a nonprofit organization with chapters all over the world, with the aim of coordinating global efforts in improving healthcare in Armenia. Finally, we have Dr. Shant Shekhermdimian. He holds a medical degree from Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and a master's in public health with an emphasis on global health from the University of California, Los Angeles. He has completed a residency in general surgery at UCLA and a fellowship in pediatric surgery at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. He is currently an assistant professor of surgery at UCLA. He is involved in several projects with the aim to improve pediatric care in Armenia, including spearheading a novel model of effective diaspora contribution to healthcare systems in home countries. Thank you all for your time here today. I'd like to start by asking Dr. Shekhar Dimian, can you provide an overall assessment of Armenia's response to the COVID pandemic? Let's start with the pandemic and then grow from there. What were some of the main issues related to COVID-19 in Armenia and Artsakh? Uh, thanks, Ani, for the question. Thanks, Arpa, for organizing this conference. Um, the COVID pandemic in Armenia, um, I guess if we were to uh, think about this and analyze it. The first question would be on, with which glasses or which perspective we should be analyzing this. Um, looking back now, I think there are a lot of things that we can um, call out or state and, uh, and uh, um, say that uh, we should have done differently or better. But I think the most important thing to remember when we talk about the pandemic is that uh, this was a very novel situation and something that uh, the entire world, much less uh, Armenia, had not dealt with. And I think uh, it would be unfair to scrutinize any nation, again, much less Armenia's uh, response with the, um, with the perspectives that we have now or that we continue to gain. Nevertheless, having said that, I would, uh, I guess, to generalize, say that uh, Armenia has, um, by and large, followed most of the uh, international uh, guidelines and recommendations for, uh, at least on the policy level or the ministerial level, for the management of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of that has changed with time. A year ago, when the pandemic was just starting, the guidelines and, and recommendations were much different than what they are now. And, and Armenia's response has changed alongside that. There are uh, certain unique uh, um, flavors, so to say, to Armenia's response, starting with the fact that early on, all COVID positive patients were actually um, kept under the supervision of the Ministry of Health, either within hospitals or at ministry designated hotels. And that was an interesting response, some, one that we uh, did not see in, uh, in other countries. Uh, ultimately, as the numbers grew, that, uh, that practice uh, stopped as well. Um, it's unclear and remains to be determined whether A, that was necessary or B, provided any benefits other than having a pretty interesting cohort to study and, and uh, research um, because uh, of, the, of the controlled setting that everybody was in. Um, much like many other countries, Armenia has uh, thus far faced two major peaks in the uh, pandemic with the most recent one coinciding with the, uh, with the war and the period uh, immediately following the war. Um, there has been a lot of um, very, there has been a lot of uh, um, challenges along the way with the management of uh, the pandemic. Some of them have to do with the, with the social and cultural uh, parameters that go along with uh, society in Armenia, namely compliance with uh, recommendations or, or guidance as to how to minimize uh, transmission. On the Could medical you speak a little bit to that, do you mean that people were having a hard time wearing masks or isolating or restaurants closed, et cetera? Sure. 
Uh, yeah. So even before the war, I think the war sort of threw threw everything off the tracks. But even before the war, there was uh, significant um, uh, difficulties with uh, um, with compliance to recommendations, including social distancing and, and wearing masks in public uh, places. The uh, um, the government's response um, was initially uh, again in line with uh, with recommendations and and pretty aggressive with regards to to a lockdown, um, closing down of uh, restaurants and other non essential places. Uh, um, were schools closed, Sean? Schools were closed as well and were remote for a while. Uh, Armenia, I guess I would say, was also on the on the leading side of reopening things as um, a delicate balance had to be played with regards to trying to maintain uh, precautions for the pandemic versus uh, um, allowing for enough economic activity, uh, you know, for the country to, um, to, to remain afloat, basically. And I'm assuming there are major differences between major, the cities and the villages. Uh, the rules applied nationally. Uh, enforcement was yes, different and and less so in the in the rural areas. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of uh, objective evidence or 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 um, data as to compliance, for example, within um, uh, urban versus rural. Uh, we do know that some of the patterns are different. For example, in uh, in Yerevan, uh, interacting in restaurants or other uh, public sort of uh, venues is a little bit more common. Whereas in in rural areas, uh, family gatherings at people's houses uh, or larger gatherings may be a little bit more prevalent. So there are those variations. And how would you rate the availability of sort of medicines, doctors? Uh, yeah. Yeah, good question. So availability of, uh, I guess the one, uh, the one thing where we definitely had a critical shortage of was, um, was oxygen. Many uh, people on this call uh, or on this uh, Zoom session are well aware of the fact that at one point uh, in Armenia during the second peak, we in fact didn't have enough oxygen, uh, which is the staple or the, or the most important part of the treatment uh, for uh, patients with uh, uh, respiratory issues related to, to COVID. Um, the reasons for that are multifactorial, but uh, largely stem from the ability to produce oxygen. And the ministry has had sort of a, uh, or the Ministry of Health and the government has uh, attempted to address this uh, by uh, procuring more uh, generators uh, to so that the hospitals can pr uh, produce their own oxygen. And maintain the, the demand. What about the availability of just be beds and spaces? You mentioned earlier that. Um... Yeah, so early on, there was a pretty rapid ramp up along with uh, um, uh, very quickly building additional wings to the um, main infectious uh, disease hospital in, um, in Yerevan. Uh, in difference to how many other countries uh, have managed the pandemic and, and hospitalizations related to pandemic, Armenia has tried to isolate these patients in uh, uh, a limited number of hospitals rather than um, allowing for providing their care in, uh, within a certain floor or wing of every single hospital. And uh, um, again, initially with the, with the ramp up, there were some issues. There were times, particularly during the second peak where there were not enough hospital beds uh, and patients had to wait at home until hospital beds opened up. Uh, that has since, uh, because the numbers have come down has, uh, is no longer the case. We are though notably seeing an uptick in the number of cases over the past week. Um, and uh, some of the, hospitals that were dedicated for uh, COVID patients only, which were recently uh, shut down or, or, or put on hold are now being reopened in anticipation of a rise in the number of cases. And what is the status of vaccine distribution now? Vaccine distribution is just now getting started. There is a very limited number of uh, Russian produced vaccines that are available in the country right now. However, Armenia is part of a, a global alliance called COVAX, which 
uh, in principle is supposed to sort of uh, facilitate or, or, or allow for a more level playing field between countries uh, with regards to vaccine acquisition. And through the COVAX program, we are um, supposed to be receiving uh, gradually uh, aliquots of, uh, of different uh, vaccines, namely uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is the one that we have uh, coming to Armenia over the next couple of months. Interesting. So right now you would say it just tier one where healthcare, is there a implementation plan and execution plan? That's there is a phased approach with, uh, with different uh, uh, categories of patients, which is not too uh, different from what we have here in the United States. Currently the number of vaccines that are available is so low that uh, we haven't even, you know, made a dent in, in the first tiers. And so, um, we are waiting for the for the large larger shipments to arrive over the course of the next couple of weeks so that vaccinations can be ramped up. Okay, great. Um, just shifting, pivoting a little bit, can you provide an overview of how you feel the diaspora responded to the COVID pandemic? Like what were some of the successes? What were some of the shortcomings? So, um, what I would say to that is the following. Actually, the COVID pandemic in last year, there was a lot of um, changes to the way the diaspora responded to their credit, uh, to our credit. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, new remote ways of us interacting with our colleagues, whether that was uh, sort of uh, on the educational front with uh, educational conferences or, or lectures, uh, and even provision of um, healthcare via telemedicine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, standing alongside our colleagues uh, and uh, going through difficult cases or otherwise discussing various uh, topics that pertain to COVID and then ultimately uh, to, uh, to injuries secondary to the war. But what I would say with regards to the response of the diaspora is that even if by some miracle there was um, a tremendous response by the diaspora to both of these major issues, uh, it was going to be unlikely and it was, and this did pan out to be the case, that our impact was, was severely limited. And, and the reason for that, if I can just speak globally, is in my mind, there's, there's an 80-20 rule to, to involvement of, of any external stakeholder or anyone uh, or organization that wants to be able to have an impact during times like this. And, and, and the 80-20 rule is that 80% of your, your impact and your potential effect is all the work that you do up until the time that this crisis erupts, whether that's a pandemic or war or anything else. It's, you're only able to you know, ramp up your ability to be effective or impactful about 15 to 20% more than uh, what the status quo is. And, and I think going back to you know, thinking about that along those lines, the diaspora, had a lot of work that it should have done before we had come to these um, uh, scenarios of the pandemic and war. And I think we, we lapsed in a lot of that. Um, a lot of this stems from the fact that the diaspora still views uh, its participation and role in healthcare in Armenia as a humanitarian contributor rather than an entity or a stakeholder or a group of organizations or individuals that are able to strengthen the institutions that ultimately provide and deliver healthcare in Armenia, whether that's uh, uh, hospitals or the Ministry of Health or government or even the medical schools or the Ministry of Education. So I think if we think along those lines, that not only sort of sets the frame with regards to how we could have done things better, it's not about how we could have done things better once COVID erupted or once the war, you know, the first. Uh, uh, bullet was fired because at that point we were extremely limited in what we could have ever done. It was about everything else that we could have done in the ensuing 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years that we, uh, that we have shortcomings in. And, and rather than sort of frame it along those critical lines, the question now is what can we do in anticipation of 
the almost certain likelihood that we are going to be faced with some other uh, event that we need to be prepared for. So can we start getting prepared now? How do we do that? And of course, the answer to the first part is yes. And the second part is a little bit more complicated, but I'll stop here for a second. Well, um, I, can I just probe a little bit? Um, so if you had to change one thing about Armenia's healthcare system, what would it be? Uh, interesting. This question was asked at a conference uh, on the East Coast uh, a few years ago, and, and someone came up with a half joking, half serious uh, uh, response that I'll, I'll, I'll say here. Um, they said, if we want to, you know, if we want to improve healthcare in Armenia, if you had one thing to do, what would it be? And, and he said, create 150,000 uh, uh, middle class jobs in Armenia. And, and, you know, obviously, that's like a, you know, wishful thinking slash philosophical response to it, but it does, you know, there's truth to it. it uh, there is a, a lack of um, resources. And ultimately, if we have that, a lot of things can fix themselves. But uh, the serious part of that is once we do have those resources or even using the limited resources of what we have uh, on a 20,000 foot view uh, perspective, answering that question, I would say that both Armenia as well as the diaspora needs to change the focus of their activities from only or merely ensuring access to care to thinking about improving the quality of the care that is delivered to patients in Armenia or to the population of Armenia. Okay, and you did allude to this, but I'm just gonna ask just to tease it out so we can all hear your message loud and clear. If you had to change one thing about the diaspora's contribution to healthcare in Armenia, what would that be? Yeah, so similar response. So let's stop thinking about Armenia as a, um, at, or let's start, let's stop thinking about our participation within healthcare in Armenia from simply being limited to procure, you know, uh, provision of humanitarian aid to doing everything in our power to strengthen institutions in Armenia that'll ultimately be the primary and most responsible bearers of healthcare delivery in Armenia. So, uh, and again, whether that's uh, medical education, whether that's quality improvement projects, whether that is um, uh, improving any other healthcare processes in Armenia, rather than relying on our, uh, largely our current model of, um, either short-term medical missions or allocation and, and delivery of supplies. If we can think about the bigger processes uh, and strengthening the local institutions so that the, you know, the country and the healthcare system can essentially be on cruise control uh, by itself, then that would be a far more impactful uh, intervention with a much bigger return on investment. Building local capacity. Yes. Okay, thank you, Sean. I'm gonna pivot a little bit to our next panelist um, uh, who I first met or first heard of uh, through a clip of a video I saw. And then I asked my friend Hasmik and I said, who is this person? How come I have never met him before? He makes me so proud to be an Armenian. So Dr. Armin Hagopjanyan, I'm gonna share like, the clip that I got to see and I think along with Many of our other friends got the uh, got to meet you for the first time through this clip. So let me see if I can figure out my screen share. And okay, can you all see the screen? Yes. Wonderful. That's perfect. Dr. Armin Hakobjani is a surgeon who flew from Los Angeles two days earlier. What are the extent of the injuries you're seeing as a result of Azerbaijani attacks here in the hospital? Absolutely massive. These are not a simple injury that these kids are suffering. Those are 20, 25 year old kids that are going to defend their own home. They're defending their own country and they're being blown to pieces by 21st century 
mighty weapons. I'm sure you have quite a comfortable life as a surgeon working in Los Angeles. Was it hard to leave that behind and come here to a war zone? No, the hardest thing was just to explain to your parents, to your wife and to your kids that you have to uh, come here and help other kids. That was the most difficult part. What actually was I'm just going to put some under my eye. Sorry. I'm honestly kind of shocked by the results of the quit. Okay. All right. <clears throat> this is a reality. Uh, usually we get a little siren, so we know we need to go into the bunker. But sometimes siren doesn't work, so we get the bomb before the siren. But it's okay. We're, the, we're getting used to it. Thank you for letting me share that um, screen. Takes us back to really a dark chapter. Um, Dr. Hagopjanyan, within days of hearing about the war, you were on a plane to Armenia, leaving your family, a thriving medical practice, and going to the front lines. Can you please give us a glimpse and walk us through a glimpse of your experience? Bringing back a little bit bad memories, Ani, but <clears throat> uh, it's kind of, uh, I think we already beat it out, uh, told stories many times, but I think what Shant, Dr. Shahar Dimian was referring to, I think we should stop thinking about a separate entity, this is Armenian diaspora. If we are joined together, then there will be no questions who should go and who should stay. I think it's the, um, uh, it's a duty I think it's the uh, normal response. Uh, we, we all talk about who did what during the war. It doesn't matter. Everybody had to do something what they could. And if everybody would do their job, probably we wouldn't be in such a tragic state like we are here. Um, but there should not be any question for uh, any doctor that they need to be there and help. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we are uh, living in France, the United States, or Armenia. Uh, the first response was, as you know, from Russia. Yeah. Uh, Russian diaspora today is a bigger diaspora than uh, than American or French diaspora, and they are more connected. So, can you speak uh, a little bit about that because I don't think everybody knows that the first response was the Russian surgeons. If you can talk a little bit about that, the Russian diaspora is is closer to Armenian than any other diaspora is, and I think that's where we need to be uh, in the United States and in France. Uh, we are kind of disconnected. Uh, we live in different realities. Uh, we live in, um, I, I can call it the la la land. Yeah, we live in a very comfortable life in the United States and in France. And when you talk about uh, standard of care, we talk about the first response, uh, we need to understand it's not very easy to do in Armenia in those conditions where our colleagues are working. Uh, Russian uh, colleagues understand it better because they fly back and forth and they work more often uh, in medical institutions. And that's where they know how difficult it is to provide care in Armenia and what needs to be brought. Uh, we talk about sending oxygen. It's not just the sending oxygen generating machines. It's about every single instrumentation. But then we also need to make sure that this instrumentation and technology is actually being used properly. We do not want to send something very expensive and going to waste because people are not educated how to use it. I mean, 25, 28 years ago, we were sending MRI machines and CT scanners. Okay, the machines were there, but the radiologists were not ready to read them. And now after the training, then they start actually understanding how to read the MRIs and CTs. The same thing is happening today. You send very expensive machines, very expensive technology, but you don't provide the proper training. Even in the United States, when you uh, encounter a new technology, uh, a, a representative of a company comes to you, comes to the hospital and does an in-service. And that's something that's missing in my opinion. We need to educate a little bit more. We need to be connected a little bit more. We need to build that bridge. Uh, today, I think we, as a response to what happened, I think more and more societies are joining together and working together, collaborating together, coordinating the work together so we wouldn't be um, duplicating the help uh, or duplicating the work. Uh, so that I think is very important. And uh, most importantly, that all of a sudden we all became soldiers, uh, not generals, I think uh, people uh, especially during the war when we were talking to each other, we were just 
asking each other what needs to be there. And uh, even with Sean, when he was flying to Armenia, I was already back to the United States. We were talking about what instrument he needs to take. Amazingly enough, he was able to understand what what means the external fixation and what does shouldn't be taken there because everybody was just dumping stuff in, take this, take that, and a lot of things were useless. Yeah. So uh, the I think coordination is the very important part of what needs to be done. Coordination, expertise. Um, when you arrived on the scene, what would you say were some of the capacities that Armenia had? Uh, you just mentioned there are over 100 hospitals in small Armenia. I mean, the population of Los Angeles County is bigger than the whole Armenia. And we do not have 102 hospitals in Los Angeles County. However, we are not, uh, we are not in any crisis, uh, whether it was earthquake uh, 1994 or, or any other crisis, we are fine. So I think when we talk about coordination and collaboration, it needs to be also done in Armenia. Uh, not just between diaspora and Armenians, but also between the hospitals. Uh, we talk about uh, what I would change one thing in Armenian uh, medicine. I would change the standard of medical care. I think if we establish standards uh, and uh, protocols and every hospital will follow them, I think we will be much better off. Uh, each hospital has its own standards. Each uh, doctor has its own protocol. And we don't have that. I mean, we talked about uh, uh, treating COVID patients, but was there a protocol? Absolutely not. You go to different doctors, they were all giving you different medications. You were giving different ideas. Uh, I was sick with COVID. I, every, every colleague of mine was calling me and giving me some ideas. Uh, it's even a funny story. One of my friends who is not a doctor got sick with COVID and his wife uh, was calling everybody she knew. and. Three days later, he calls me and said, Armin, somehow my wife is feeding me 35 different pills. And I ask, why? Well, every, everybody gives uh, advice to my wife and she's taking it and she's feeding me more pills. So uh, I, I told him to go to the hospital so his wife will stop feeding him all these pills. But <laughs> the whole idea is if we establish protocols and share it, I think we can uh, be better off as well. Maybe one hospital will say, you know, your protocol is wrong. Let's do this and we will try it. The same thing as in the United States. I mean, what happened with us during the first uh, crisis, we didn't know how to approach this. Uh, we didn't know why we're losing so many lives. I mean, experience in New York and experience in Los Angeles were completely different things in, in the month of March and April. And look at us now. Uh, we, we followed protocol and we're improving drastically. And I think Armenia will improve too if we establish some standard of care and, and protocols. So a systems approach, a more systemic approach to, to, I guess, the medical sector is what you would say, to have standards that all hospitals and all doctors abide by? Uh, yeah, but in, in conversations with my colleagues in Armenia, they always blame American doctors as being robots. Uh, you all know what to do because you just follow the protocol. Yes, I know. But at the same time, if you follow protocol, you at least know you're not going to uh, make a major mistake. Uh, there are a lot of mistakes that are being made. Uh, and some, some of those mistakes are costing lives, uh, costing limbs. Uh, we, we, we're not allowed to make mistakes. We can cre be creative in our treatment approach. We can be creative in our surgical approach. But you cannot make a major mistake if you follow the protocol. So how would you, having said that, categorize the standard of care that is offered? What is the average standard of care that the average Armenian receives in Armenia? Uh, well, I, I do not have uh, such statistics there, uh, but uh, I know one thing. I mean, we, we live in the United States, right? We do trauma. I mean, I'm sure there are some trauma surgeons here in, in, uh, in this panel uh, and, and in this Zoom meeting. Uh, if the patient is taken back to surgery for any reason within 30 days after the initial surgery, that case will be reviewed, will be reviewed by colleagues. So these colleagues will take a look at this case and we will make a decision whether there was a mistake in the first surgery or not. Uh, well, I've never seen it in Armenia. Uh, it, it's a more camaraderie than collegiate relationship. Uh, people do not like criticizing their own colleagues. Uh, we don't like 
criticizing our own colleagues here as well. But it, it's a little bit of more uh, constructive criticism. We're, we're making ourselves better when we criticize ourselves. Yeah, we improving find our own mistakes. You know? uh -huh. uh, every time when I uh, give lectures, uh, I always show the errors that were made during one or the other procedure. And I show them how these errors can be fixed. Because if you do not know how to fix it, then you're in trouble. And uh, we give these interesting ideas to our colleagues in Armenia and in Russia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they take that. And then when they encounter the problem, they have difficulties getting out of there. They do not know what's the next step. And I keep getting phone calls from my colleagues a lot of times when they say, well, this has happened. What do I do now? So uh, I think it's a continuous education. It's a continuous exchange of ideas, continuous uh, maybe seminars, lecture series, but we shouldn't just be coming from the, the golden United States of America and tell them what to do. Absolutely not. But if we sit down as colleagues and we discuss cases, uh, it, it, we can actually give each other better ideas. Uh, we need to learn how to talk to each other rather than teaching them what to do because we are better off. Is there, okay, so do you feel realistically, is there a way to provide that level of top level medical care without having the capital input that somewhere like America has? Uh, coordination with uh, medical specialties has nothing to do with that. Uh, it's all about human approach. Uh, if we can take our uh, uh, criteria for who is a better surgeon, which hospital is better, or which hospital should charge more, or this is a better doctor or not. If we can sit down and talk to each other and discuss one uh, simple uh, problems of the patient, we're all going to be better. I, I can give you examples when uh, patients are being treated in certain hospitals in Armenia by uh, specialists who are not top notch. And, and we have such an understanding in the United States when we transfer the patient for a higher level of care. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, that's an unknown, unknown factor in Armenia. Nobody transfers patients there, yeah. at least not to my knowledge. Uh, people right. are always bringing somebody else to their hospital saying, we will bring them in so we can treat them here. But if you know that there is a, uh, a best plastic surgeon in one hospital, why don't you just transfer the patient there for a higher level of care? In my opinion, that's what needs to be implemented. And when we start discussing these patients together, and it actually happened over the past three months, we have uh, introduced new platform for the local surgeons, at least orthopedic surgeons and plastic surgeons. So we share patients' x-rays, we share patients' uh, photos, and we actually give each other's ideas. And uh, people feel comfortable now talking about their own problems. So this will help without any capital input. Yeah. I can chime in for a second on yes, these. Do, do. If I can try to take a stab at answering your question uh, by referencing an article that was published a couple of years ago, I, I think it really uh, sets the perspective in a, in a different way, definitely a game changer for me with regards to um, issues with regards to healthcare in Armenia. So this was an article that was published in the Lancet, I believe, that talked about prevent preventable deaths in, in the world. And in Armenia, it showed that there are more preventable deaths that occur because of the quality of care that patients receive, rather than due to a lack of access to care. And I think this there is no stronger message that I think can be given to anyone, whether it's local government authorities to a diaspora healthcare organization or a, or a physician that's in whatever state that they're in with regards to where is the most bang for your buck? Is it to do things that solely improve access or increase access to care, sending of that shipment of medical supplies? Or is it doing something that improves the quality of the care that that, that is delivered to, to citizens of, of Armenia? And, you know, many of us have always thought that it's the latter, but it wasn't until uh, 2019 when we now actually have good scientific data that, that shows that. And so everything that Dr. Hagopchanyan has, has suggested, and then some, should be the way that we... Um, 
we think about, at least mostly think about, our contributions to healthcare in Armenia. Wonderful, great. Um, I want to just push back a little bit in the, thinking about this capital situation uh, versus not um, by perhaps, and I know, I think we had mentioned this in an off call we had had once, um, but looking at a different country like Israel, Israel provides almost US level healthcare at a very reduced expenditure, partly because they have a very nationalized healthcare system and because they live in a state of emergency as if there is always a war. So emergency healthcare system is integral to their society. Do we have lessons we can learn from Israel? I made an example of that Israeli system uh, several months ago. I think the fifth prime minister of Israel uh, in one of her speeches said that uh, the people who need to make the most uh, amount of money with the highest salaries should be uh, military personnel, doctors and teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the salaries of Armenian doctors is so low. Uh, they, they are occupied uh, not just with the idea how to help their patients, but the idea how to survive. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, uh, one of the bigger issues. Uh, on top of it, uh, we talk about the number of uh, hospitals in Armenia, uh, over 100. Well, look at the graduates of the medical school in Armenia. I mean, the population of 2 million people uh, gets more than 500, do 500 doctors a year graduating. I mean, where do these doctors get training? How do they uh, get their jobs? Um, we have overpopulation of hospitals in Moscow with all the graduates of the Yerevan Medical Institute. Why? Because they simply had to go and find a better life elsewhere. Uh, I myself, you introduced me as a graduate of uh, medical school of Armenia. I did not graduate there. I started my education there. I uh, finished three years of schooling and then I moved to the United States uh, because I realized I, I will not get uh, a very good education in Armenia, even though I was working since I was 17. I was working in three different hospitals. I knew uh, most of the doctors. I knew who is great and I knew who I shouldn't learn anything from. Uh, so we, we understood that uh, in order to get better, you need to move out. Uh, and that's what people are doing these days. So now when you take into consideration the salary of doctors, when you take into consideration the compensation of the hospital for each patient, and you realize that it's not even enough to provide a, a minimal a standard of care, then you need to talk to the government and say, listen, you cannot survive on this level of compensation. So the government needs to step in in this position. We have private insurances. Uh, we have six private insurances these days in Armenia that provide better care. Uh, cash is always a better care, uh, but only 10 to 15% of Armenian population can afford that. So you're talking about the minimal uh, better care for people who have money and um, terrible care for people who cannot afford anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure many people will agree here that uh, every time you have a relative or a friend in Armenia, they're calling you here, asking you, do you know a good doctor that I can go and see? Good endocrinologist, good or ENT doctor, good surgeon, good orthopedic surgeon. Uh, even though here in the United States, you also ask those questions when you want to find the best one. But if you go to, let's say, a Holy Cross hospital, you wouldn't be thinking, oh, my God, did I get a bad doctor or a good doctor? We know that the standard will be there. And that's not the case in Armenia. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, shifting gears a little bit to the present, we have about 10,000 wounded soldiers and seven rehab centers. How is this unfolding? Uh, when, when we say wounded soldiers, we need to understand the categories, uh, how we approach these uh, injured uh, soldiers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you go from the very obvious injuries, such as uh, amputations, to uh, injuries to the joints and, and limbs, uh, the patients that are actually uh, unable to move their limbs because of the damage to the nerve, to the muscle, or whatever, people with the hearing loss, people with the PTSD, uh, people with stomas that are still there. So you have to have, again, collegiate approach uh, to coordinate help. 
uh, these days, uh, many organizations are, are helping and trying to coordinate that work. Uh, many organizations jumped on uh, doing prosthesis on the very first day. Finally, we realized that we need to coordinate and now only two organizations are providing with care. Uh, many orthopedic surgeons are uh, looking into these patients and making suggestions to local colleagues uh, what kind of instrumentation needs to be brought to Armenia to provide the care, whether it's a, a joint replacement, uh, which is very difficult to consider in a very young patient population, uh, in the United States, it's unheard of to put a, a shoulder or, or elbow replacement or a knee replacement in an 18-year-old. Uh, but when you look into this massive trauma and what are our other options, uh, you have to think a little bit uh, differently. We have to come up with some ideas, new ideas, and it's being done daily. The discussions are being done daily. What what would be the best approach? What, what should we do for this young population of injured patients? Uh, many patients are simply living because we cannot provide the care. We cannot provide care because we do not have artificial eyes. We do not have uh, implants that are available in, the, in Armenia. And even though if there is a huge number of amputees, we can bring prosthesis because we need them there. But if you have two or three patients who need artificial eyes, it's better off to take them out of Armenia and get that helps elsewhere. Uh, you talk about uh, spinal cord injuries. I mean, we, again, different standards. United States, you do the surgery on the L4, L5 level, the patient gets up the next day and start walking. Uh, you have patients that are still in bed for a month. Uh, is it the standard of care? Maybe they should get some second opinion and, and get moving. Uh, you cannot have uh, a massive approach. Every patient should have an individual approach. And at the same time, you need to have the, I think, uh, teams of experts who can actually provide advice, not necessarily go and do the job. Uh, we need to provide advice. We need to share our knowledge and we need to teach local doctors because they will be the ones seeing these patients for the rest of their lives. Can I, can you list just in case anybody is listening or will listen to this um, once it's like once it's been aired. Um, what kind of rehab services particularly are needed right now in Armenia? What kind of professionals are needed for them? Uh, if I would change one thing that is being done in Armenia today, I would bring uh, an army of psychologists. Uh, PTSD is, is a very real thing. Uh, and unfortunately in Armenia, seeing a psychologist and psychiatrist is still a stigma. Uh, especially for young men, they do not want to be called crazy. Uh, but it is obvious, and we're, we're hearing cases of all these soldiers being angry, angry at their family, at their friends, angry at their doctors, so that anger comes up. And PTSD is not, uh, is not a diagnosis made by some tests. It's a diagnosis made by questionnaires. You need to talk to these people. And if they don't talk to you, you cannot even make the diagnosis. I think that's very important part that we need to change in Armenia today. Uh, there is a effect of placebo. Uh, placebo has amazingly 50% efficacy rate. Um, and I always make my uh, patients when they come in and they have some, some doubts about whether they should do the surgery or should not, I always tell them there is an opposite of the placebo effect as well. If you don't believe that this surgery is going to help you, it might not help. So come back when you're ready for it. So we need to work with uh, all these young injured soldiers uh, so they can actually believe that they can go back to their normal life because many of them are uh, giving up. And it's been only four months. On a, on a simple standard, it takes about two years. If they still depressed after two years, these soldiers will turn into alcoholics or drug addicts or, or something else. But we, we have a very limited time to help these people to get out of the depression. I even remember you being there temporarily or back and forth. I, in one of your interviews, you mentioned that um, you were waking up every hour for months afterwards, um, after leaving Armenia, after the war, every hour you would wake up with almost PTSD-like symptoms. So for you, mental health sort of trumps everything else right now in terms of what needs to get done ASAP in Armenia. Uh, yes, I, uh, I spoke to my friends and my colleagues and many of them told me that I have PTSD and I think I did very well because I was talking to them all the time. 
I was working all the time. I was busy helping people. I think that helps. Uh, when you work, uh, you don't think about those troubled, troubled times. But if you don't have two legs and all you do all day long is sit on your couch and you see how your mother serves you food or drink, you get angry. Uh, you get really angry. And that's the problem. We need to get these people busy with something, busy with work, busy with education, busy with uh, learning new skills. Uh, we need to change that. And we don't have time to wait. We have to do it now. You said, uh, losing out on one of your interviews, I can't remember, but or maybe it was just a conversation we had had, losing out on an opportunity to change the course of action is an insult to all the people that were lost in the war. How are we going to build, change the course of action? And you suggest if you had to pick two things, what would you pick? Well, I think we're changing the course of action now, even right now, talking to each other. I mean, I see a lot of colleagues here listening. Uh, and um, I think this is a beginning. I don't remember this kind of conferences 15, 20 years ago. I don't remember so many doctors from the United States uh, traveling to Armenia and working in the hospitals. Uh, I don't remember such a huge uh, travel uh, from from Russia uh, with uh, trucks and trucks of uh, supplies and, and instrumentation flying and driven to Armenia. Uh, this is what we do now. We're changing this course of action. We're, we're getting together. Uh, we do have some uh, bad elements uh, in Armenia that uh, are not happy with what's happening uh, because we're changing the status quo. Uh, but in my opinion, what we do for people and we do it without any reservation will pay back. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hagoptanian. And finally, I'd like to turn our attention to our third panelist who's been uncharacteristically silent, Dr. Viken Sepilian. I want to focus a little bit on the diaspora and ask you to discuss um, some of the experiences that were, we were having here in the diaspora as you led so many efforts. Can you first start by speaking to the roles of the various healthcare stakeholders in Armenia? Ministry of Health, the National Institutes of Health, the Erevan State University, et cetera, and then we can go expand off of that. Uh, thank you for uh, moderating this uh, being a very valuable um, event. And um, also I'd like to thank the ARPA Institute for you know organizing this um, this event definitely, it is a very valuable um, engagement. Um, I'd like to also make some disclaimers that, um, you know, we have some, uh, all three panelists are, you know, um, Southern California based and um, that uh, many of the aspects, at least that I can say for, for you know, what I'm gonna say, um, are something of mostly, of uh, subjective opinion and um, and there may be some disagreements. Um, I also would like to say that whatever is discussed uh, by me, and I'm sure that the other panelists would also agree that in no way is a um, uh, criticism that is geared to be punitive or to be taken and turned into uh, uh, criticism of a, an institution or as an individual. Um, uh, I would venture to say that regardless of, um, uh, you know, whoever uh, is in charge or would have been in charge, um, we probably would have found ourselves in um, a similar situation. Uh, having said that, the uh, comments that I um, am making are from the capacity of the uh, my experience, which has been as the president of the Armenian Medical International Committee, which is an organization that has been around for several decades and has affiliate member organization. It, it is an umbrella organization of other organizations. Um, that uh, has affiliate organizations throughout the diaspora hubs. Uh, you know, uh, half a dozen organizations throughout uh, North America, several in South America, um, 
several in France, uh, the Netherlands, UK, Moscow, Lebanon, and so on. Um, I'd like to first start by, uh, you know, describing some of the activities that were done uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic, and Chant already ha hit on some of these. Um, I, I remember conversations that uh, members uh, of the organization had almost to the, uh, you know, to the day a year ago. Several weeks ago, um, last year, uh, I remember having you know the first conversation with Dr. Shakhar Dimian in regards where where Armenia still had not had a um, a known case of COVID, and um, and how quickly that this you know and and all that that has happened in the in the past year. I believe the first case of COVID in Armenia was in late February, early March, uh, March 1st, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, it was good to see that um, already diaspora organizations, especially ones that were being uh, hit hard or were beginning to see cases, were already thinking of what if this happens in Armenia? And, um, uh, I, I fully agree with Dr. Hagob Janyan and, and especially Dr. Shekhar Demian where, you know, perhaps many of the activities where we could have been more impactful um, uh, should have already been in place. However, given the situation that we were in, uh, the diaspora was able to um, pretty quickly uh, level and learn some existing or relatively new uh, platforms and technologies to reach, um, uh, to get the expertise from various parts of the world that was hit and the front lines to uh, bring that latest information uh, to our colleagues in Armenia. And some of these platforms um, gave us a little bit of an advantage because uh, by using things like we are using right now, like Zoom being one of them, uh, we were able to circumvent um, some of the historic barriers or bureaucracies that may have been in place where uh, we may not have been able to reach as many um, healthcare professionals as we uh, were able to um, during the response to pandemic. Um, there are, um, and, and, and this, the, these sort of uh, between the diaspora and uh, our, our colleagues in Armenia was done in a fairly comprehensive way. We were able to engage the, um, you know, the highest uh, institutions, uh, including the Ministry of Health, the National Institute of Health. Many of the, we were able to go directly into the hospitals that were uh, taking care of patients. Um, oftentimes even doing telementoring or telerounding uh, with intensive care uh, specialists from the West, um, you know, answering direct questions uh, and discussing uh, specific patient related uh, questions with intensive care counterparts in Armenia at a multidisciplinary level, not just physicians. This, this, uh, these discussions were also taking place at the nursing level. Um, and, um, um, and I'm not sure when, where the comment was made. Um, the uh, protocols evolving and were changing. We were on top of it in making sure that we shared it uh, with, with our counterparts. It was also good to see that there were some professional organizations in Armenia that were participating in these exercises who were taking these protocols and, um, you know, and uh, um, making sure that they were translated or adapted to what uh, 
you know, what uh, our colleagues in Armenia can do. Uh, Dr. Hagopchanyan said an, you know, anecdotal case of a colleague whose wife, um, you know, came up with um, a protocol themselves who was not in healthcare, you know, that that's actually a, um, you know, spot on in uh, the point that just because there are protocols in place doesn't mean that there is going to be adherence to these protocols. And, and, uh, and yes, that, that is take that did take place and that is taking place in Armenia. But keep in mind that that's also taking place all over the world. That the very, very similar case happened to a colleague and a friend right here in California. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I mean, I think that, you know, when we are talking where all three of the panelists are here talking from the United States, keep in mind that there are some protocols that may be or could be more relevant to Armenia and all over the world that may have slight variations depending on availability of technology, the availability of expertise, and also availability of medications uh, um, uh, in Armenia. But um, I also would say that, you know, uh, before we are critical um, of um, protocols, so to speak, in Armenia, we only have to look at ourselves. It was just a few months ago where in Washington, D.C., uh, on, on the steps of a, you know, of a, a federal uh, institution, there were a group, group of physicians who were touting hydroxychloroquine uh, as an effective uh, intervention and also uh, criticizing some uh, very well-established public health guidance in wearing masks and, and uh, physical distancing and, and whatever have you. So, um, you know, protocols are one thing. We can be a, um, we can be a, um, uh, you know, a very diligent in making sure that we share um, whatever expertise in, in, in terms of protocols are available uh, with are adapted to fit their needs and their uh, circumstances on the on the uh, um, on the on the ground. Um, I, I have to say that that um, the take home as to you know from um, the uh, the times of uh, the times of um, can, you're free to, to the uh, pandemic was that we were able to see uh, for the first time. Um, is that is that better? A little bit, yes. Try speaking in on the. So I'm going to shut off my. Yeah. So uh, so essentially, um, you know, for for the first time, at least in, you know, in my involvement in Armenia over the past decade and decade and a half, in various capacities with different organization to the table. Uh, of course, perhaps it was an element of there was, a, we were in a global pandemic, but the various uh, institutional stakeholders were able to, the NIH, um, the hospitals, we were able to uh, bring in many uh, professional societies that, that um, you know, uh, that, that, had members in a specific discipline, including nursing, including mental health, including uh, you know various fields of, of medicine, and um, um, and also uh, involved the newly formed uh, Office of Diaspora Affairs, which was which played a role in facilitating uh, some of these activities. We were able to engage the USAID to the uh, American Embassy that provided uh, sponsorship and funding for professional simultaneous translations to make sure that 
nothing was lost in translation, that everything was uh, relate to our colleagues in the, uh, not only in the highest quality from our end, but also was make sure that we, um, you know, it was provided to our colleagues um, uh, properly. Um, and this was done in multiple forms. Uh, like I said, some of them was um, uh, short lectures, providing the latest medical evidence. Many of it, however, was format. Um, and we also deliberately set out to uh, engage uh, specialists who are on, um, you know, on the state of affairs in Armenia or have been to Armenia, worked in a hospital or were familiar so that it wasn't sort of... Uh, a, a session that was just, you know, talking top down, uh, the, the expert from the United States just talking down to their, you know, counterpart in Armenia. Often these discussions were bilateral. Um, I can say that even, you know, I, I, I picked up, and as I always do uh, in these types of exercises, picked up some things that I learned from colleagues in Armenia. So, um, so essentially that's how, um, um, you know, that's how I would uh, characterize, uh, you know, the uh, pandemic response in the initial part of what diaspora was able to do. Now, keep in mind that um, there were many requests from Armenia to our diaspora organizations in so far as um, equipment, uh, PPE, supplies, and so on. And as a result of the, there being a whole global shutdown, the um, normal um, uh, supply chain um, uh, avenues and, and uh, transportation avenues were disrupted globally. Uh, and essentially the, the diaspora for the most part well, um, much of those requests, uh, I do remember in the beginning part, uh, we were able to get some PPEs and um, some whatever I could fit is where I am. The uh, signal, it may be inadequate, but um, if, if you can't hear me, just, I guess, send me a text message. Uh, okay. Maybe if you want to re-log in, do you think that will help if you log out and log back in? I, I you know, I where I am is that the signal isn't to where it should be, but I'll just try to do my best. Uh -huh. And if, you know, if I fall off, then I'll just ask, you know, I'm sure you will moderate and be able to uh, fill in. But uh, yeah, I do remember, you know, one day filling up my car to, to as much as it can and meeting Shanta in the airport or somebody else at the airport who was traveling to Armenia right before travels shut down to get as much as equipment that we could. But that was just some minimal effort. I think the most valuable, you know, valuable uh, activities that the diaspora was able to engage was share of knowledge and expertise. Okay, I think this is my cue to moderate. Um, v, can you hear me, uh, Dr. Sapilian? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. And not now. Well, I'm just waiting for you to ask another question. Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, from what I heard, it was good because it just is a perfect response to, I mean, I'm very curious, uh, Dr. Sepilian, if you could talk a little bit about how this response in the diaspora amongst the healthcare organizations, et cetera, was qualitatively different during this war compared to all previous times versus, you know, humanitarian crisis, the earthquake, et cetera. A very good question, Ani, and you know we can um, you know we can comment. I guess the uh, response to the uh, pandemic uh, differently than um, 
the response to the war. In regards to the response to the pandemic, obviously this was something novel to all of us. And, um, but I have to say that we, we had the benefit of having, or this network uh, that was already in place, um, had the benefit of having expertise from some of the cities that were in the front lines, whether it was in Europe, whether it was uh, on the East Coast, New York um, was a very, very, um, having uh, so affiliates in New York that were engaged um, in sharing knowledge was uh, very um, uh, effective in trying to bring actual first hand, hands-on experience to our colleagues in Armenia. Um, nevertheless, it was novel to all of us, not just in Armenia, also in the diaspora. So, um, so essentially, uh, you know, I mean, I guess when we look back five, 10 years from now, we'll have the final uh, postmortem on, so to speak, on how effective those interventions were. Now, talking about the war, the, you know, the um, response to the war was different insofar as it, um, at, and, and I'm, it, when I'm talking here, I'm talking about, again, in the capacity of AMIC and some of the organizations that are either tightly or loosely affiliated with AMIC. And also, I should say that there are, there were many other diaspora entities or organizations or individuals who also engaged in activities uh, in response to the, uh, you know, both to the pandemic and to the war, some Armenian, some not. Um, so the, you know, the, my my response or my description here is in the capacity of the 2025 or so organizations that are part of our umbrella. Um, when it came time to the war, it the um, philosophy that was taken is that. Uh, this is a time of war. There is a chain of command. The, the um, you know, in a war, uh, the general gives the orders, the uh, subordinates uh, in the chain of command follow those orders. And in the, you know, in the heat of war, um, the uh, ground foot soldier should not stand up and say, you know what, I, I don't like the general, I don't, uh, or I don't agree with the general and essentially, and they may not necessarily fully uh, need to understand uh, the order. Um, however, the expectation is to follow the order. And, um, and I did see a lot of that uh, sentiment uh, when it came to uh, our AMIC related or AMIC affiliated organizations. Um, again, you know, once the war is over, there are always opportunities to look back and say, you know, the chain of command was effective in this area. The chain of command was not effective in this area. The necessary changes uh, and alterations are made in strategy and in expertise and in personnel. Um, you know, however, the sentiment of the response was exactly uh, just that um, uh, when it's compared to any other uh, times. Mm -hmm. I can just add to that. I think more than the sentiment, also organizationally speaking, things were different, particularly at the time of the war. There was improved lines of communication between government organizations in Armenia. Uh, in our field, particularly the Ministry of Health and through the High Commissioner's Office for Diaspora uh, with AMIC and the healthcare organizations. And then within AMIC, um, you know, it was very nice to see how uh, the organization itself, quote unquote, sprung to action, which is something that I have not seen happen before. We get together for a buy, you know, every two years for a meeting. Uh, uh, we discuss things that pertain to the meeting, but uh, the actual work, uh, the weekly meetings that happened, the coordination, geographically speaking, between the diaspora organizations, as well as sectorally speaking, you know, those who 
uh, took on uh, uh, procurement and shipment of supplies versus those who were handling the oxygen problem. Uh, it was uh, it was actually really nice to see, and I think sets the uh, sets a good tone for future work. But then, to to spring forward, I think it's important for us not to lose that. And unfortunately, we are seeing this slowly start to dilute off again. Uh, we should have a similar approach for all of the other issues that have always been present in healthcare and continue to remain there. Uh, they are, in my mind, crises, just like war is. The state of medical education in Armenia should be handled like the healthcare, for, from the diaspora perspective at least, uh, like how we handled the um, need for certain equipment that came from the, the diaspora to Armenia during the war, the uh, you know quality improvement projects, whatever it is, our contributions, the the platform of Amik really stepped up in a way that uh, I had not seen it step up, uh, or maybe there wasn't an opportunity for it to do so over the past decade. But we need to use that uh, programmatic advancement. Uh, to further all of the other healthcare related work that we have been doing so that we do so in a much more effective and sustainable way. Great. Thank you, Shant. Um, Dr. Sapilian, can you, you mentioned something, I just want to um, touch upon it again. Can you talk a little bit about who these collaborating bodies on the diaspora end were and who um, some of these coordinates are? Better. Uh Who's receiving it in the homeland and who's sending it? Who are some of these big bodies? Of course, um, and, and Shant mentioned a few of the things and I didn't wanna get into too detail, um, too much of a detail, but um, one thing that was very, very um, heartwarming to see is that the traditional sort of uh, demarcations of, uh, of you know, there being an organization in Montreal and, and there being an organization in Toronto and in Uruguay and in Los Angeles. These are all sibling organizations that um, uh, oftentimes had uh, historically our own, um, you know, our own sort of uh, pet projects that um, we engaged in. But during the pandemic and more so during the war, um, the, a lot of these hard demarcations between organizations melted away, um, or there it wasn't unusual for Amik to form a committee where um, you know someone from Los Angeles was working with somebody from New York and Boston and and Lyon, and um, and you know where there was a problem where the solution to that problem may have been. You know, in front of us for for many years, and um, you know, um, but you know, because of this, you know, bringing the pieces of the solution from different geographic locations, we were able to ex execute. And and of note, I mean, there were uh, a few uh, major committees that were formed. One that was in constant communication with the Ministry of Health. Um, uh, and some of the hospitals that were, you know, uh, carrying the brunt of the uh, care and receiving live uh, updates on what are the things that were needed. So, and this was placed on a live document that was updated, uh, you know, uh, as the need was uh, brought to us, sometimes daily, sometimes, you know, weekly and so on. And this this document was accessible to all the diasporan you know organizations, and whoever could had a contact or a connection, um, actually engage their connections to bring these you know that that item uh, or that equipment, and so on. Um, second, there was a committee for personnel, actual personnel, and you know the uh, you know the the. Again, Amik formed a committee that took on volunteers who would sign up and uh, on the receiving end, the Office of Diaspora Affairs would, um, you know, uh, shoulder that uh, burden, uh, being in touch with the various hospitals and saying, we need this type of surgeon, we need that type of 
surgeon and um, and we were able to make sure that the, these volunteers that were traveling had all their paperwork taken care of, um, um, their their uh, accommodation taken care of. Someone was meeting them at the at the airport and make sure, making sure that they are getting to where you know they were supposed to be, so to speak. Um, you know, also many people who traveled brought with them. Uh, actual bags and bags and duffel bags of supplies and equipment, which, uh, you know, needed a, um, you know, uh, infrastructure of making sure that they were cleared in an uh, expeditious manner through, you know, customs and so on. Uh, oftentimes, they, these, these supplies were um, uh, given, you know, given up at the airport. And, you know, people from our network went the next day to the airport and cleared these items in customs and that they were, um, you know, able to collect those items and delivering them to where, where um, you know, they were needed. We had a committee that, you know, focused specifically on big ticket items like, you know, ambulances, big surgical, uh, you know, big surgical uh you know, items, uh, radiologic equipment, uh, and, and so on that, that they focused specifically uh, on that and, um, and so on. So um, during the height of the war, there was a, you know, um, uh, obviously, there, there were some avenues that were expedited and facilitated by the government. Um, of course, you know, nothing was perfect. They, you know, not everything um, that was meant to reach its objective reached its objective. There are much that we learned um, and that we could have done better as a diaspora. However, you know, given the circumstances and the fog of war, so to speak, which the fog of war spilled over to the diaspora where we essentially were a part of the war effort, right? We were the logistics of the, of the war. So in, in, in some degree, you know, we were all soldiers, so to speak, um, uh, you know, that, that um, uh, and we sprung into action and, um, to, of, of course, we've learned a lot. A lot has changed since then. And there were a lot of inefficiencies, you know, both from our end and from the Armenia end. But, you know, there was quite a bit of coordination that actually, as a result of that, um, it's the objectives of those activities were, you know, were reached. Again, let me ask, I'm gonna, I'm opening it up to, um um questions from the audience and one uh, audience member and you may know this or dr hagel chan whoever chime in um from the experience of all three speakers is there any willingness on the part of the ysmu to work with the diaspora to reform medical education fundamentally any of you could speak uh to I spoke about status quo, uh, and probably the biggest status quo is the State Medical Institute. Um, it, it's very difficult to change things, uh, especially right after the war when it's very unstable, even with the political uh, form of the government. Unfortunately, everything is political in Armenia these days, depending who you know, who you work with, this is how you're going to change the, change the system. Uh, I think we need to engage every single person who is responsible for the future in Armenia for medicine. And that includes the institute, that includes the ministry. Uh, but we shouldn't be depending on the government. Uh, Dr. Sepilian spoke about how great of a response uh, diaspora had during the war. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it is also a fact that not every single uh, respond uh, got the result. I mean, we all know about the uh, 
piles and piles of supplies sitting in the warehouses of Ministry of Health because they didn't have a personnel, didn't have an understanding what to do with it. And this is going back to the beginning of our conversation that there needs to be coordination and there needs to be a bridging. Uh, we cannot be making decisions here without engaging people in Armenia. Uh, they need to be willing to work with it. Uh, we cannot be uh, setting up standards of care if the standards of care are not accepted in Armenia. Uh, and protocols are great. Uh, we talked about somebody following them or somebody's not following them, but it's at least establishing protocols so we can have less preventative deaths. Uh, Dr. Shigardimia was talking about, I think is our responsibility as a group. So uh, I'm not sure about uh, how responsive or how acceptive uh, accepted uh, our criticism and our ideas are in uh, institutions in Armenia. Uh, but we have to dial, we have to start a dialogue somewhere. Uh, we have to start talking to them. Dr. Hakobjanian, Dr. Alex Jawarjian asks, you mentioned that mental health is, is very important. Do you feel that Armenians um, in Armenia are receptive to mental health? Is the culture receptive to it? And if so, how does bringing therapists in help? Because if you don't bring the therapist, you are just giving up. Because those therapists know how to approach, those therapists know how to talk to these people. Okay, they need to understand, uh, that, uh, explain what, what the problem is with them. Uh, many people are not diagnosed properly. Many people are not um, screened properly. Uh, and that's the biggest issue. Uh, if you don't bring, uh, a cardiothoracic surgeon into the group of doctors, you will probably miss out on all the cardiothoracic surgeries you can do to save them. So if you don't bring therapists who will actually go on the field and start talking to these people personally, you will not change anything. And what's the alternative if you don't bring the therapist? Okay. Mr. Armen Morian asks, um, Dr. Hagop Janyan, elaborate on your observation that there are elements in Armenia opposed to changing the status quo. This would seem to be an important systemic issue to examine and address. Uh, I would uh, I, I would answer that question if those people from status quo would be present at this discussion, so we can have a dialogue. I think it would be unfair for me to talk about somebody uh, who is not able to respond. So uh, I'm sure these dialogues will happen. Uh, I'm traveling to Armenia in six weeks, and we already have a lot of meetings, uh, a lot of live interviews, and I'm sure these questions will come up. And then there's another question sent privately to me, um, so I'll maintain anonymity, but it's something I think a lot of people um, in the diaspora ask, whether silently or um, out loud. Um, there are a number of fundraisers everywhere, e from the diaspora, on Facebook, et cetera, for wounded soldiers now. How do we know that all these funds are legitimate and how can we ensure that they actually get to the sources? Uh, by uh, checking on their work, in my opinion. Uh, we all talk about many uh, fundraisers, but why did they happen? I mean, did anybody ever ask um, why all of a sudden so many people start raising funds and helping personally or building houses or helping this hospital, that hospital. Because in my opinion, uh, the main so-called legitimate source of uh, charity fund, in my opinion, failed in multiple levels. So uh, people lost their faith. Uh, people realized that the job is not being done properly. There was absolutely no accountability. There was absolutely no report. And um, people stopped believing into the, uh, any other governmental organizations. I mean, you, you, you had over 250 fundraisers on Facebook alone. And were some of them illegitimate? Yes, I'm sure there were. Uh, some of them use our tragedy for personal gain. They're still doing that. So I think accountability is the most important part. And, uh, it's not just a one-time event, right? We're all going to come back, every charity organization is going to come back and say, okay, this is what we did with your money and this is what we're going to do if you give us more. And then you will see which funds will survive and which funds will disappear. Thank you. I know, Viken, you know a little bit about the mental health situation and initiatives being done there. I just want to pivot back to that so you can add to that conversation as there's another question about that. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Anian, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Hagopchanyan in so far as the importance of, um, you know, mental health, um, uh, adequate mental health support for um, in the post-war era, um, and uh, and there are again several groups uh, in the diaspora that are you know, that are engaged in activities, uh, both direct patient care and uh, some that are engaged in uh, training um, the mental health therapists in, in Armenia, some that are um, uh, finding ways to finance. Um, and, may, you know, a point was made that physicians are, you know, badly underpaid in, in Armenia. Well, you know, if physicians are badly underpaid, imagine what a mental health specialist is. So there are um, activities underway, uh, both, you know, amongst uh, Amik affiliate groups and ones that are not, that we are familiar with, that we are coordinating with, that are engaging in mental health activities. And it is reassuring to see that uh, some of the groups um, um, are um, uh, providing some of this training at the highest evidence-based uh, uh, fashion. And um, so, of course, we can always do more, but, uh, you know, the point of mental health being an utmost uh, priority is very well taken and being heeded. Thank you. Excellent. Um, we have a question for Dr. Shekhedinian. Um, as the world is getting vaccinated, how, can, how to tell when it is good to travel, when it is safe to travel to Armenia again? Uh, uh, tough question. It involves a lot of sort of personal risk perception and, um, and some unknowns about the, the vaccine as well, particularly with regards to uh, different strains and mutations that may that may come along. I think that uh, uh, everyone just has to take um, take you know the the facts that are available and 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 make their own personal decisions. And the vaccines are not one hundred percent proof uh, foolproof, but they are pretty good. Uh, we think that they cover the available or the or the present strains right now, and. Um, and so if that's good enough for you to, to, to travel versus, you know, you're, you're personally not a risk taker and, and uh, want more data to be available or, or have a clearer understanding of how long vaccines work, et cetera, et cetera, then, then again, it becomes a personal choice. I'm not sure I have a good answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's fair. Another question that was posed to any of the doctors, actually. Um, I read somewhere that an estimated one third of the young population is actively trying to leave the country. This is this will be an inve inevitable discourse. And so should we be preparing to help those who would leave, like to leave for education work to try or should we be encouraging them to stay? Uh, you, you, we should always encourage people to uh, rebuild Armenia, whether it's it means staying in Armenia or leaving Armenia, it's up to that person. We had uh, multiple events in, in the recent uh, history. Uh, in 1990s, there was a huge uh, outflow of Armenians, and at the same time, probably had some uh, the best economic times in Armenia 10 or 15 years down the road. Uh, and now it's happening not because of the economic situation, but in my opinion, because of the political situation. Uh, it's difficult to predict what's going to happen if the young population will leave Armenia. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen to our country, uh, what's going to happen if, God forbid, there'll be another war. And um, everybody should be ready for it. Want peace? Get be re be ready for the war. Uh, so uh, we we need we need to work with the younger population, uh, younger generation, uh, giving them a hope of the better future. If we don't do that, then we we lost we lost everything that we did. So be the best version of yourself, whether that's within Armenia or outside, and try to rebuild Armenia. 
from wherever you're at. Well, well, I have a, a lot of conversation with uh, a lot of my cousins, for example. All of them want to live. Uh, all of them want to come to America and get a job. And they don't even realize how difficult it is these days to get a job in America or anywhere else. Uh, so many people then um, change their minds and want to go to Russia. Russia accepts everybody. It's very easy to get a job. And uh, probably the economic state is many, many times higher than in Armenia. But at the same time, you always have somebody behind. I mean, the, the, the model of uh, Armenian economy was that the younger men should go out and then send money in for grandmothers and grandfathers to survive. Uh, well, that, that model doesn't work. Uh, the model doesn't improve the economy. The model simply uh, enriches uh, several pockets, but doesn't do anything for the future generation. So we need to just show the hope, uh, show the hope and uh, at least show them what can be done in Armenia. In my opinion, it's very important. Along those lines, any of you, um, Mr. Victor Arajanian asks, do you think that the current leadership crisis in Armenia will have major implications for the domestic transformation of healthcare in Armenia? Or would you rather support the government's come and go perspective? Uh, I, I believe that uh, what we do today in diaspora should not be dependent on any government. Uh, governments currently uh, are trying to control the situation, but uh, we we had this discussion in the past uh, that the excuse uh, that was given to us, it was always you guys left Armenia for better life, we're the ones here and we will be making the decisions. It would be a very valid argument if we had a better result. When we have the result that we have right now, I think uh, something needs to change. We all understand that we need to change the system. Uh, I believe that the medicine is apolitical. I believe that we should be apolitical in any regards, to, regardless of what government is there. And we also uh, need to be independent of government regulations. We should follow the rules. We should follow uh, the, um, the policies, but we should not be dependent on ministry. We should not be dependent on the prime minister. I, that's my personal opinion, at least. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to chime in? Um, I'll add, yeah, yes. Any crisis, including the current leadership crisis, I think will uh, does have uh, very real implications for uh, healthcare transformation or system strengthening. Uh, specifically, it slows it down or it decreases the prospects of it happening. So, um, the 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 sooner we are in a more stable place politically uh, and in terms of leadership, then the more likely the country will be to um, restart any of the processes that are generally positive with regards to uh, putting the healthcare system on a, on a more solid platform. Having said that, and I think it's, uh, you know, to play both sides of the, of the coin, um, it's also not reasonable to, to sit back and wait for that rosy idealistic day where all the ducks are going to be lined up, everything's going to be perfect, we're going to have perfect leadership and, and political stability and no prospects of war. And so there is still a lot that can be done even in the current situation. Uh, and so I think, you know, the approach should be, uh, should be both to do whatever we can in the current situation, but also do everything we can in our power to promote uh, stability and, and, you know, lack of turmoil. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gardner. Uh, oh, did somebody want to uh, add? Yes. Honey, I just want to apologize. If I don't leave now, I will miss my plane. So I really oh, God, apologize. Thank you so much for joining us. I need to fly back to Los Angeles. So thank I really appreciate this opportunity and I wish you uh, a wonderful uh, weekend. Thank, thank you for all you do, Dr. Thank Hagop. you. Thank you, Hagop Chanyan, Dr. Hagop Chanyan. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one final question. And Dr. Bahodaryan asks, um, first, he thanks all the speakers and then asks, what should be the next steps for our diasporan organizations to affect positive efforts in healthcare in Armenia and beyond? Can you give some examples from your representative organizations to help establish this framework? Dr. Sepilian, you might be best suited to answer that. Yeah, thank you, Garni, for that uh, question. And, you know, it really is a, um, a you know, perhaps a, a great question to part on. 
Um, you know, the, Dr. Shekhardamian made a point um, earlier that um, there was some, you know, encouraging uh, level of, you know, pan-diasporan uh, coordination of efforts, uh, specifically, um, you know, specifically some of it geared to um, capacity building, which, you know, which hope, which we hope that our activities um, uh, focus around that. Another point was made, and I believe it was by Shant, is that uh, perhaps that uh, much of the um, activities of the diaspora um, in the past few decades, at least in the healthcare sphere, not saying all of it, but, but much of it, the focus was on humanitarian activities. Um, instead of uh, helping build institutions that can uh, potentially um, uh, shoulder the, the burden of some of these big uh, healthcare related issues on their own. Um, and, uh, you know, the hope is to, um, you know, to refocus or reframe the way we look at, uh, you know, the, our activities in Armenia. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, these the, these back to back events, the pandemic and the war has helped us uh, reboot and, and re, re, reset um, our outlook and uh, according, accordingly directing our efforts. Um, to that end, um, you know, this is a, a very valuable exercise that we're going through um, and that uh, I'd like to say that there are several other organizations, um, you know, um, it, it, that are going through diff, uh, similar exercises and Amik ourselves uh, are uh, doing a similar uh, analysis, a, a comprehensive analysis of, you know, of what our activities were, you know, in the last, uh, in the past uh, couple of years. Um, also taking into account the perception of um, of the recipients of these uh, activities, and not just the perceptions on on the end result that these activities uh, led to in Armenia and Artsakh, and um, uh, and I would uh, like to invite everyone to sort of participate in in discussions of the findings of these analyses later on this year in September. Um, you know. Uh, you know, typically AMIC helps organize an international medical congress uh, every other year. Um, and this year it, it will be a virtual one um, uh, and uh, focusing specifically on, um, you know, on this uh, analysis and hopefully maintaining um, some of the elements of the diaspora's activity that will uh, build capacity and result in the most meaningful uh, impact, positive impact for our homelands. Thank you, Dr. Sapilian. Um, we've run out of time, so we are going to have to leave the conversation there. But I want to thank Dr. Hagopjanian, Dr. Shekhar Dimian, and Dr. Sapilian for taking these hard questions and to all of you for watching. Thank you from me, Ani Shahbazian, and the whole team here at the ARPA Institute in solidarity. Thank you, thank you, Ani, and thank you doctors for your very excellent uh, discussion. Uh, just an announcement, our next uh, panel discussion is also very important and uh, it will be on how can education, science and technology in Armenia be modernized? And the panelists will be Dr. Ani Abrahamian, who is the uh, uh, director of the Alekhanian National Lab now, and also a professor in Notre Dame University. Dr. Mary Papazian, who is the president of um, San Jose State University. And Dr. Naira Hovagimian, who is a professor in um, 
New Jer uh, in uh, Illinois, University of Illinois, and she she works quite a bit with Armenia, and she's familiar with the technologies. And also Dr. Ara Nazarian, who is also very familiar with with especially the medical technology. So, and the moderator this time will be Dr. Bruce Borosian, who was the president of the Armenia, uh, American um, University of Armenia um, in, in past, previous, uh, previously. So we invite you to all participate. It will be on Saturday, April 3 at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you're all invited and thank you all for participating. Thank you.